All righty. Might as well kick off. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we are organizing, and by we, I mean South Pole, myself, Santos Amadeo. I work with Climate Projects based in Australia. And we're organizing this webinar along our partners in Feedworks. Today's topic is navigating methane emissions challenges in dairy and beef industries. Bit of housekeeping. Um, yeah, you would have noticed the ones who haven't had this app before um, that you are not able to use your audio setting. So please send all questions that you have during the webinar um, to the question box, write them down and we'll make our very best to try and answer them all towards the end. Uh, for you to know also, this session is being recorded and it will be sent over to all registered peoples um, a few days after the webinar. So, uh, I wanted to start by introducing the speakers today. We got Ian Sawyer from Feedworks. Ian is a partner and ruminant nutritionist. He is and I demonstrated the history in working within the information technology and services industry. Ruminant nutritionist since 1987, holding qualifications in animal production, and is an honorary fellow and former president of the Australian Association of Ruminant Nutrition. Ian is going to be going first, covering the why of this webinar. And following him, we'll have Shanti Morse from South Pole. Shanti is the head of climate projects for Australia and New Zealand. He's a professional with over a decade of experience in nature-based solutions. With, it, with his team, Shanti is setting up Australia's first methane avoidance projects for dairy and beef cattle and developing ways for landowners to access investment. Without further ado, we'll have Ian take the floor and explain to us the why. Ian. Mute button, please, Ian. Sorry, team. I do apologize. Santos, great to be here. Um, thanks, everybody, for uh, uh, for tuning in. Um, so one of the hopes that we have today is to bring a little bit of clarity, a little bit of understanding to, to people that are looking into this space and getting an understanding of um, whether we're moving into a compliance space or a voluntary space how the establishment of a project around methane abatement or greenhouse gas abatement on a, a ruminant enterprise can be undertaken. Um, there's sort of you know, two ends of the spectrum here. Um, some people think that you know, greenhouse gas and methane abatement is going to be rivers of gold on beef and dairy farms and sheep enterprises. That's unlikely. Other people say it will be completely impossible to achieve. I think that's also unlikely. I think these things are very achievable. And some of the things that we'll go through today, um, Shanti establishing sort of the, uh, the the aspects around what certification looks like and myself talking a little bit more about what happens on farm would hopefully inform people and uh, create some interest and enthusiasm around uh, brushing away some of the unknowns around a project development. So with that said, um, let's look at a couple of things. Um, the things that I get asked around this space is, you know, will the ruminants have to be required to drop methane output and how would we go about doing it if we're, if we're required to do so? Slide. So let's start with the why. There's an, a sort of a landscape out there that creates interest in a tool that successfully combines methane abatement but with productivity gains because when we start doing some of the economics in this space, we are certainly going to have to stay in the black, i.e. remain profitable if we ever hope to get into an environmentally friendly position. Slide. The questions that I get asked are, yeah, will you be forced to reduce um, methane? You know, and what about this whole net zero position? Well, my comment to that would be, I'm pretty darn certain that we are all going to, in ruminant enterprises, be expected to do something around methane abatement. Um, I do not think that we are going to be expected to get to net zero. I think that will be very difficult in uh, ruminant enterprises, but do expect that we're going to have people looking upon us and saying, do something. And who will those people be? Who will those people be asking us to do it? Well, 
if we're in New Zealand, clearly there's a, a bit of a policy position pushing that along. I don't think the same policy position exists in Australia. I think in both countries, we can expect supply chain pressure, um, supply chain from milk processes, meat processes, potentially the banking sector, a number of things along those lines that would, would push us to be, be doing things. Um, how will I do it? I think that we will all be looking at enteric methane because other means of reducing um, greenhouse gas fire offset probably won't make a huge dent in the carbon uh, created in ruminant enterprises. Enteric methane is substantial in all those enterprises. Who will be the umpire in all of this? Well, there will be somebody certifying us. There will be that need to undertake a project and have a certified position. And that, that need will be there whether we're doing it under a voluntary process um, or whether we're going to be doing it under a future uh, compliance situation through a government or somebody along those lines. The big questions I get asked are, will I get paid to do it? Um, and the answer to that, if I was speaking to a dairy farmer or a beef farmer was, well, probably not a great deal and nothing from the government as yet in um, Australia and New Zealand. And if somebody's not going to give me lots of money to do it, will it pay to do it myself? Should I step up and consider doing these things? And the answer to that is yes, if you get productivity as well as methane reduction. Slide. Everybody would like, when I say everybody, um, our, our broad sector would like methane abatement to be voluntary. Nobody's stepping up to pay for it yet. We're not getting paid an extra you know, dollar a kilo for meat. We're not getting paid an extra dollar a kilo for milk solids. And my experience having previously played in the monogastric sectors around um, eggs and chicken and pork and looked at uh, how some of the evolutions have occurred around animal production in those areas is that don't expect huge premiums um, to come into the, the market for this sort of scenario. Do, however, expect that we might have some exclusion. And people might say, I'm sorry, if we don't step up, you will not be part of this supply chain. So I think that we need to take that with a, a little bit of realism and recognise where the pressures will come from and recognise it, as I said earlier, perhaps it's not going to be rivers of gold, but action will be required. Slide. We often get caught up in a discussion whether we say, is enteric methane like all the other greenhouse gases? You know, there's that whole stock gas versus flow gas, methane's only there for 10 or 12 years, you know, we're not the same as the guys, you know, with uh, gasoline and, and fossil fuels and all those things. So, you know, should we or shouldn't we have to do something? My suggestion to everybody is, recognise that we are going to be grouped in with greenhouse gases for some time to come. And even if we were to be excluded, the expectation is that our sectors will move either to do things to prevent future warming or to do our bit towards future cooling because methane is a faster turnaround scenario. So I would suggest to us that don't sort of pin your hopes on us being carved out from greenhouse gases and not having to do anything, that won't occur. My suggestion, however, as ruminant sectors are that we should not be talking about these 80 to 90% reductions that are likely to occur, uh, or that are, uh, not likely, that are, are very difficult to occur, because when we tend to drop out 80 to 90% of um, methane, we're changing the animal's physiology quite extensively. And, and often we produce problematic sort of um, spin-offs from that around dry matter intake declines and animal productivity declines. My suggestion is, as a sector, we might be better off to talk about a 30% um, abatement of methane, knowing that we can achieve this while staying productive and staying profitable. Because I think that we are less likely to line ourselves up for a knock to the chin, having over-promised and under-delivered. Slide. So let's, having said that, and that's a little bit of our landscape, now let's look at some modes of action and some of the economics of the methane abatement tools that we could consider to make the outcomes that we might like to make. Slide. What's going to underpin the uptake of these styles of products? And um, there's one large commercial group that um, had some discussions with, and they have this sort of setup that they call four goods. You know what, I kind of like this. Is the tool that we're looking at good for the cows and the stock? Um, you know, and my orange comments underneath, you know, do we have any welfare issues? Do we promote, not impede, the well-being and the productivity of the animal? Is it good for the farmer? Are we going to promote, not cost the farmer money? Will there be um, a positive response to the profit and loss statement? Is it easy to use on farm? Because if it's tough to use, we don't want to have certain things mandated on farm if they're really tricky. 
Is it good for the consumer? Is it good for food safety? Is there no incremental cost for the consumer? And of course, is it good for the environment? You know, will we lower the methane? Are there any other contraindications? What I like about this is it introduces the concept of combining attributes beyond simply methane abatement alone, because methane abatement alone is not the only thing that our producers and our supply chains will consider. Slide. A couple of quotes from um, a great paper by Cotter, 2015. Um, there's a, a couple of things here, but methane mitigation strategies that increase animal productivity and have low cost from implantation are clearly going to be the preferential things that are going to support uptake of a tool into a commercial setting. The price paid for carbon will absolutely have a, um, an impact on whether we want to do this or not, but a lesser impact than whether we can actually make it work commercially in a real world setting. Slide. And from the same paper, um, the options showing the greatest prospects provide productivity and would increase financial viability. So this is doing things that are common sense, almost independent of our methane space, knowing that a positive methane space will be dragged along with that. Slide. Now let's try to bring our tools for methane abatement into two broad types. The first broad type are the methane inhibitors or the enzyme blockers, um, as they sometimes call. And they block or um, inhibit the enzyme pathways that see methane being formed in the rumen. These guys are interesting. They work very quickly. Um, they have the potential to reduce methane quite substantially. They're not easy tools to handle in many um, real world settings and they have to be in the room and fed into the room in about every three or four hours. Um, so there's some real positives around those guys, but they've got some things that are unresolved as yet. The second group of things that we might consider around methane abatement are rumen modifiers, which we use to change the nature of the rumen biome, the bug population in the rumen. These guys don't reduce methane as much normally, but they are easier to use in many cases, a bit simpler, a bit more robust, usually considerably cheaper, and they bring some productivity gains, where the enzyme blockers don't tend to bring productivity gains. We're not making more meat or milk when we use an enzyme blocker. Whereas with rumen modifiers, um, some of the products in particular have some quite healthy and robust uh, data around productivity. Slide. Be aware, and this is one of the sort of the myths I'd like to dispel. The simple reduction in methane is no guarantee of a repartition into anything productive. I have heard so many times, you know, this last seven or eight years of, of, in the methane space has been like a, a growing hobby for me. And, and how many times have I heard that I've reduced methane, so therefore I will make more milk or meat. That's just simply not the truth. In actual fact, there's been any number of instances where methane has been reduced quite substantially. And in the face of that substantial reduction in methane, we see negative impacts on dry matter intake, negative impacts on productivity. There is no clear link and direct link between reducing methane and increasing meat or milk. That is just a furphy. In fact, if we reduce methane really big licks at 80 or 90 percent, the chances of us having a negative impact on productivity probably go up. There's some interesting situations that said, where does the H plus go? If it's not going into methane, where do the H plus ions go in the rumen? A recent paper I read was suggesting that it's in interfering with glycolysis in the rumen, and that's having its own impacts around rumen health and the animal wellbeing. So, you know. Some interesting outcomes. Don't assume that a simple reduction in methane will automatically make more meat or milk. It doesn't. Slide. Right, what is this stuff worth? If I reduce methane, what is this whole you know, value equation looking like? And we do this by predicting the dry matter intake of an animal, timesing that by a number of grams of methane allocated per kg of dry matter intake, and then converting that off to CO2 equivalents. The CO2 equivalents are the things that we actually attach a price to. And I've got three classes of stock here, a 600 kg dairy cow eating 20 kilos, a 500 kg beef cow eating 12 kilos, and a 300 kg steer or heifer eating eight kilos. We use a 20.7 grams of methane per kg of dry matter intake. That's the Charmley number, um, pretty well published number. We can argue that it's not always 20.7, but for the sake of the exercise, it's a good mid range number that we can use. What we see there is a net value of 100% of the methane or the greenhouse gas of 35 cents, 20.7 cents or 14 cents. 
And in this, I'm using $30 per tonne for a tonne of CO2 equivalent, which is around about an Australian carbon credit um, unit at the moment. So 35, 20.7 and 14 cents for 100% of the methane abatement. Slide. And if I looked at what happened with a reduction of 15% or a 30% or a 90% reduction, I can see the net value that I could potentially realise in the current market for that methane or that CO2 equivalent. So on, you know, with a modest 15% reduction, I've got five odd cents of CO2 equivalent or three cents or two cents, depending on the stock class. If I reduce it by twice that at 30%, I've got 10 cents or six cents or four cents. If I could reduce it by 90%, which is a very big ask, 31 cents, 19 odd cents and 12 cents. Clearly, not a lot of point spending more money than that to get those returns. That gives us a ceiling of what we would be willing to spend to create a break even. And for many people, I don't want a break even. I'd probably like a small, modest return on my investment if I was going to invest in these tools. Slide. So let's look at some products that might create a 15% reduction, a 30% reduction, or a potentially 90% reduction. And I'm going to use a rumen modifier on the left. In the middle, I'll put one of the enzyme blocking tools and on the right hand side, I'll put another enzyme blocking tool. Using $30 per tonne, looking at the little partial gross margins, 5.2 in the top left, they're 5.2 cents revealed in CO2 value, but spending six cents, I will not be in front. Down the bottom right hand side, I could put in an enzyme blocker where I am yielding up 18 cents you know, a beef cow, 18 cents worth of CO2 equivalent, but it might cost me $1.20 for the uh, for the enzyme blocker, well, I'm losing a dollar a head a day. What we see in all those circumstances is that nothing is paying for itself at this point based only on the methane abated. Next slide. So people would say, right, well, at the current ACCU or the current tons, you know, that's not going to pay. What if we double the price? of our, our CO2 equivalent to $60 a tonne. That's above the market at the moment. What would happen if we did that? Slide. Now we would see that the value of our CO2 avoided, you know, the methane abated, doubles up. And what we're seeing is a net positive, and we've actually got a, you know, a, a small positive on our post partial gross margin on the rumen modifiers, but we're continuing to be in a, uh, a net loss making position um, for the enzyme blockers based on you know, input prices that I'm, I'm using there. Um, and I think those input prices are reasonably accurate based on, on world markets and, uh, and public uh, understanding of where those things are at. So if we could double up the price of CO2 equivalent, um, the ruin modifiers would pay for themselves. At a current uh, CO2 equivalent price, we would look for productivity in order to be in the black. Next slide. Shanti is going to talk about how we maximise the value for our carbon. You know, that's South Pole's um, specialty and we want to do the best we can with our carbon. But almost irrespective, I can be very confident in saying, as we looked at the Cotter paper earlier, we are going to need some productivity gains to make all this work and to be attractive to primary producers. A net break even is not necessarily attractive to somebody. If we say to somebody, give us a dollar and we'll give you a dollar back, not lots of people jump at us. If we say, give us a dollar and we'll give you two dollars or three dollars back, more people are going to be interested in that whole outcome. So productivity remains important. Slide. I'm going to make a couple of comments around um, three of the common products. Um, Bromoform is the active in a couple of the, uh, the enzyme blockers. What Bromoform is good at is it reduces methane reliably and in quite big licks if we um, put it in. It's got a number of unresolved circumstances or an un unresolved uh, features, I would say that. Um, the data does not support it making extra meat or milk. Um, you know, simply reducing methane does, does not seem to be producing extra um, meat or milk. There seems to be some suppression in dry matter intake in a number of the trials um, and the high methane reduction seem to be the ones that are producing uh, more risk of uh, negative productivity outcomes. It's a very vol volatile compound and it's not easy to use in our extensive systems. We need to put it into the room in every three to four hours. 
bit hard to do so outside of a TMR. It's pretty expensive to use, um, but you know, it does reduce methane reliably. So that's, that's a positive. Next slide. With 3NOP, um, which is the Bovier uh, brand of stuff, what we like about this one is it too reduces methane reliably, and we can say that it's very safe and it's certified through the European Food Safety Authority. It also has a data set that suggests it's probably not going to give us uh, meat or milk uplifts. Um, and when we don't have these meat or milk uplifts, it becomes harder to make a payback. It's a tricky molecule to deliver outside of a TMR as well. So extensive use of the molecule in licks and dairy feeds and pellets and those sorts of things becomes a bit tricky. It too needs to be delivered every three to four hours. Uh, the data suggests it's probably less effective in higher fibre diets. And whilst the price point is not known in Australia, we know it's about 30 euro cents in the EU, so it's probably about 50 cents coming up in Australia, you know, if we're going to have a direct relationship to the EU. Next slide. I'm going to use Agalin as the uh, the room modifier. Um, what do we like about Agalin? Well, it's got published data on its productivity, um, about a litre of milk or, you know, 40 to 60 grams of, of meat per day. It's easy, it's robust, it's already in use by a little under 200, uh, 2 million head globally, so it's very proven and safe and productive. It's got a low price point. It reduces methane only about half of what Bovier does, at 10 to 20%, and it has a rumen adaption period because it's, it's a rumen modifier. So we're gonna need a, about a 10 day adaption period. But in terms of getting things out into the extensive world, it's very robust. Next slide. We also need to recognise that if we're going to have things that go out into our world, we don't just have the end user, the, our farming and producer clients as, as end users and as stakeholders. Our market is not just farmers. So I just wanna throw something up that's gonna throw some, some commercial reality around some of these things. Next slide. If I look at what the price of a tonne of supplemental dairy feed might be, with three different feeds involved. If I put asparagopsis in at $1.20 per head per day, and I put it into a typical dairy feed that's fed at five kgs per day, so there's 200 feeds in a tonne, my standard feed um, for dairy might be $500 a tonne at this stage um, in a lot of Southeast Australia. Asparagopsis would turn that into $740 a tonne. Three NOP would turn it into about $600 a tonne, and Aglin, um, we'll turn it at about $512 per tonne. The uplifts, any uplift will always be resisted by the market. Any uplift in price will be resisted by the market. But when we have substantive uplifts like that in feeds that are being manufactured by third party feed milling businesses, they have a significant stakeholding in whether this will or won't go. And if they chose not to turn their $500 feed into $740 feed, I would not blame them because it would be tricky. Even with Agalin, with a $12 uplift, we know that there'll be pushback on any uplift, but that is a lot less pushback. That's the dairy style scenario. Let's look at the next slide and have a quick look at what might happen if we were to deliver into a very extensive scenario using licks. Licks typically might start off at around about $1,000 per tonne. And if we start putting the price of, say, um, product A, which is a, um, uh, an enzyme blocker, and we put that into a lick, we would turn a sheep lick into a um, $1,000 sheep lick into a $4,000 um, uh, lick. And potentially, if we were doing a beef lick, we could turn it into a $7,000 lick, those incremental costs. If we used a rumen modifier at a more modest price, we will still have an uplift, but we'll have an uplift of you know, to $1,300 or $1,400. And if I'm putting that through a rural merchandise um, you know, chain, I know that the rural merchandise chains will struggle with that positioning of those very substantial uplifts. So those guys are important in our stakeholders. They are a route to market for tools like this. How are we going to bring them along for the ride to do something, not nothing? Next slide. So my little summary of my section is, um, we have an application of methane tools in practice that we can go ahead with um, you know, right away and now, and we can get people involved in projects that could roll over into compliance projects. They could stay as voluntary projects. We can get a bit match fit around getting ourselves used to being involved in this landscape, because at some stage compliance will arrive. 
and we can get ourselves a bit match fit doing some voluntary projects now, getting some money. If we get compliance going forward and, and somebody decides that, that, and quite rightly decides they may need to hold their, their carbon and their methane on farm, that's okay. They'll understand what it takes to do so. But doing what we're doing now, we could do something that's good for the stock, good for the farmer, good for the consumer and good for the environment. And we can manage all of that in the here and now. And I will say thank you and I'll hand over to my colleague. Thank you very much, Ian. Super interesting topic, a lot discussed there. Um, please put your questions down in the questions box down there. The sooner we get them, the more uh, we're going to be able to answer. So yeah, just a gentle reminder there. We'll leave it up to Shanti now to explain the how. Awesome. Thank you, Santoff, for the introduction. And thank you, Ian, for all of the backgrounding there. There's a, a good reason we work with Feedworks because they have all of that detailed understanding of the science and the commercial realities that exist within this sphere. South Pole are experts in you know, climate consultancy or climate projects, but working with people like Feedworks really gives us that sort of, I guess, gravitas and credibility within the industry. And it's a, it's a pleasure working with Feedworks. So just uh, before I jump in, too far. I just wanted to make a take a moment to acknowledge the country that I'm standing on, which is Bundjalung country, specifically of the Gujanbara people. And I wanted to pay respect to the elders past, present, emerging. Uh, we cherish the stewardship of this land, their relationship with places like Wollumbin, known as Mount Warning, uh, the beautiful rivers that snake throughout and the deltas. To get into the specifics of what I'll talk about today. I'm going to cover a little bit about getting ahead of the curve. So Ian really uh, led nicely into this and reducing your risk exposure to market forces and people pushing you to do this later on. Actually, I liked Ian's way of putting it as match fit. I thought that was a very apt way to describe it. I'll also talk about uh, some of the business cases for both selling your credits if you want to sell your credits and then also using your credits towards your compliance if you want to use your credits towards your sustainability net zero claims, these types of things. I'll run through a couple of the umpires in these industries. So the umpire for the methods that we're working with, so the ones that actually decide what uh, emissions reductions will get credited, and the people that also are the umpires for the claims uh, that people make around net zero or carbon neutrality or things like this. And I'll talk about the ways and means that we can reduce greenhouse gases. So mainly the protagonist here in this talk is feed additives, but we'll talk about some of the other ways that you can lead the pack with uh, you know, some forward thinking agriculture. Next slide, please. Actually, just jump two slides. Awesome. So quickly, I'm just going to start with the uh, business case for offsetting. So I'm going to give an overview here just of some of the main benefits uh, for carbon projects if you're selling your credits. So this is the selling your credits idea. Uh, firstly, and most importantly, you're reducing greenhouse gases. Um, we all want to tell that narrative about reducing our climate impact. Uh, for future generations, but also, you know, to tell people that we're working with, to tell our clients um, and, and, you know, future generations because they need to be considered in this because this is an intergenerational problem. Um, also with credits, we're looking at a diverse revenue. So you're getting paid to, and environmental markets came about to incentivize the changes, these positive changes that bring benefits to farms and to the environment. So you're getting a diverse revenue. Um, also, in the future, regulatory compliance. If you're getting match fit, as Ian said, you're getting ahead of the curve. So you're already ready for any of those changes that may come ahead. Um, a lot of people are afraid that what will happen is if they make changes now, they won't be counted in the future. Uh, worst case scenario, and, and I'm talking worst case because this is highly unlikely. If you have multiple carbon projects, you're selling the credits, you could use that revenue to either purchase other credits, or you could use it to implement other activities on your farm to further reduce 
your uh, your emissions. That would be worst case. Usually, what would they be looking at is they would base it on an industry uh, baseline of what the farm would look like if nothing had been done. Also, um, and I talked about regulatory compliance. This is a risk, right? This is a risk, a financial risk. If there's market pressures out there, we already know consumers are demanding this, and the, to have social license to keep operating, we need to take action. We need to set up these types of projects. It isn't in the hippie realm these days. It's in the commercial realm, and it makes sense. Um, and lastly, the sooner you get into these uh, and you start getting, you, you get started on these types of projects, the more it's more valuable because you understand you're not behind the curve. There. Next slide, please. I'll talk uh, quite briefly because Ian went into a fair bit of detail on this, but we'll just talk a little bit about the business case um, on the co-benefits of using feed ingredients. Those mainly being around uh, increasing the feed efficiency. Um, so Ian went into a fair bit of depth on that. I won't go too far. And also the productivity. So getting more milk, um, feed efficiency, the same milk you're being achieved with less feed input. Um, we're also looking at animal health and fertility, so in increases in overall animal health um, and also increases in fertility. This isn't with all, as Ian mentioned, there's multiple different feed additives, but I'm talking about the case of Agalon here um, because that's the one that we're setting up a lot of these projects with. And also we're looking at nutritional in uh, improvements, so nutritional benefits such as increased protein and nitrogen availability to the animals. Next slide, please. And so Ian talked um, fairly extensively on this, so I won't go too much into that, but I'm just going to give a little bit of a simple business case here. Um, to simplify the numbers, I've used a thousand head because round numbers make it easier. Um, for each of those cattle, we're looking at about Per year, about 0.245 um, tonnes of CO2 taken out of the atmosphere or avoided from going into the atmosphere. Um, given that one credit is one tonne of CO2 equivalent, so that's, that means you're getting 0.245 credits per animal. At a price of around $46 per tonne in Australia, um, for a thousand head, you're looking at about 11,270 per year all your carbon credits alone. Now Ian mentioned the commercial reality is that the, the carbon isn't going to pay for the product. So you need these products to have productivity gains and yield gains. Um, so we'll talk about Aglan because that's the product that we're working with. Um, when we're looking at the same cattle, a thousand head, uh, we're looking at an average milk, uh, a dairy cow, sorry, producing around 21 litres uh, per cow per day. If you're getting a 4.4 increase in feed conversion efficiency, that, that equates to about uh, around a litre, but a 0.93 litres increase. Um, if you're talking 60 cents per litre uh, for the sale of that milk, um, uh, sorry, 65 cents per litre, you're looking at a 60 cent increase in profitability for your milk. So on a thousand head car, uh, a dairy farm, you're looking at about $600 to, per day or about $219,000 per year. So you can add up the yield, $219,000 plus your $11,200 for your carbon and you're looking at a decent increase in, um, in, in your profitability there. Next slide, please. South Pole has been the leader in these types of projects and we've got a number of projects that we're working on worldwide. We actually helped develop uh, the standard for which people are registering their projects. Um, I mentioned a price per credit. Uh, what we're looking at uh, for some of the contracts that we're selling these credits for, we're looking at around 25 to 33 US dollars. So around that 46 or $50 Australian mark at the moment, but this will, this should increase in the future. I just want to talk about some of the projects we're working with globally. Barry Calibo is one of our bigger projects. We're looking at over 200 or around 250,000 dairy cows. Uh, you can see the emissions reductions there, about 230,000. This is an Agalon project, as is the Feedworks and Moo projects. Those are all Agalon, except Moo is also using uh, Natura as well. But 
all up, we're, we're looking at a large number of head, and I'll talk a little bit about why the number of head. As you can see in the last slide, it was only 0.245 um, credits per head, so you need a large number. Scale is important here. Uh, if we could move to the next slide, please. So I want you to, what I'm now going to talk about is the business case for moving now uh, before regulations, uh, before clients or the markets push you to move forward. So we'll talk about in setting first, um, some of the main concerns for, for these projects are the need to inset. We get asked very often, uh, will I have to keep my credits? It's a challenging question to answer, but uh, generally no, unless there's a regulation. Uh, but what you can do, if you want to, if you want to have a net zero claim or if you want to um, start reducing your greenhouse gas emissions, you can inset your credits. You can use these credits towards these claims and we can help you plan for that. Um, in the future, uh, and, and also currently in, in some countries, there is government compliance. There is a requirement to reduce your emissions uh, via government policies. The credits that you have, the carbon credits that you have can be used towards these compliance scheme, uh, schemes, or you can sell your credits and, and use them for the revenue um, to purchase other credits or use them towards other projects as well. One thing that um, you know is a big concern, and you know the ACCC is looking into this uh, this year from this year, is greenwashing. Um, we need to ensure that any claims around emissions reductions, around you know these climate related issues are backed, that they're not, um, that they're substantiated. South Pole has a great deal of experience in communicating the climate action that you're taking, in, in communicating the projects that you're setting up and, and setting up profitability for these projects as well. So we can help you with that journey and we can also help you communicate what's happening. Next slide, please. This is just a brief look and I won't run through all of the legislation. Um, this is just a, a snapshot of some of the legislation that's happening worldwide. Um, this isn't to scare anyone, it's just a, a, a reality of what is out there and what the landscape is looking like. As Ian mentioned, you know, it's not always going to be government regulation that pushes this. It may be consumers, which then push the banks, which then push the insurers and it pushes all of these people to, to make these changes. So it's good to get on the front foot. Australia has made modest moves um, compared to the globe on a lot of these things. Um, we have set up a 43% uh, reduction of greenhouse gases by 2030, um, which has set off a, a bunch of things there on that left-hand side, which is the Australian movements, um, like the safeguard mechanism being one of them. Our largest emitters are required to reduce their greenhouse gases by 4.9% year on year. Um, and, you know, I think that's an important one to describe, but we also have mandatory disclosure of your greenhouse gases for larger businesses. Uh, looking outside of Australia and in New Zealand, there is uh, dairy and beef producers are looking at 2025 for a tax on their methane. So it's important to get front footed on this and we can help with that. Next slide, please. So a lot of people are sitting on the fence and, and my experience in this industry is the first adapters, we're not even through the first adapters. Um, there's a lot of people waiting for things to happen, but you don't want to wait and be behind the eight ball and, and wait for policy to push you because you will uh, be playing catch up. What I do want to talk about here is, you know, if, if you do this voluntarily, you're going to be an early mover. You can get capital for your reductions now. You can sell your credits and you can make further reductions. Um, if you're looking at compliance, you can even inset your credits if you want to make those claims. Or, you, you know, you can start moving on to the, the more challenging things, the more advanced technologies that may get you uh, emissions reductions. Next slide, please. Next slide. So now I'm just going to talk about some of the standards that we're working with. Um, the big two are Gold Standard and Vera. These are the most globally recognised. And I'll, there is other uh, methods out there, but these two are the major two um, in the sort of regulator sphere. Um, I will talk a little bit more about Vera in a minute because it's a bit more of a flexible uh, regulator and it's a bit more of a flexible method because they include, and you've got a nice little picture 
of a beef and dairy cow there. Uh, currently the gold standard, which these, they're both almost an identical method, uh, currently gold standard only allowed dairy cows to be registered with their projects. Um, they both rely on peer reviewed literature demonstrating emission reductions. Um, the, and as I said, the main difference is that gold standard currently only applies to dairy cows. Let's have a look domestically, next slide. So Australia has a method available. Um, it's quite prescriptive. You can only use canola meal, brewer's grain, and a few other things. It's very, there's only a, a few eligible feed additives, and Ian can probably run through why it's not feasible. Um, there are no projects. That's why there's a big X there, um, and there likely won't be any projects registered with this method. There is hope in Australia with our own method, the Emission Reduction Fund, or I think it's called the ACU scheme now. Um, there is hope because we have a working group that are, are looking at a livestock feed additive um, method, and they're advocating for a method that better meets the needs of farmers and the supply chain and the nutritionists like Feedworks. Next slide, please. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive on the VM41 method. Um, and I, I'll just talk about what you know south pole like i mentioned we have a few projects already up and running for this but i'll just talk about some of the compliance um to get your to get your emissions reduction to get your credits for these types of projects you know the things that you need to do the checklist to make your match fit um so the for the method uh, the additive has to be approved in the country that's a bit of a no-brainer uh, the one that's not a no-brainer is it needs to have three peer-reviewed studies demonstrating the efficacy of reducing methane. You also need a peer-reviewed literature that demonstrates there's no negative health impacts on the animals resulting from consuming that additive. Uh, there also needs to not be an increase in the methane produced from the animal manure. And you need to be working as per the manufacturer's instructions. Next slide, please. So this is what it looks like to register a project. I won't run through everything here because there's a fair bit of information, but this gives you an idea of what we need to do. Don't worry, South Pole makes it easier, and South Pole in combination with Feedworks makes it easier because we get this information, we combine it, and we do all of the hard work in the background. You just need to give us your number of cows, your location, your business as usual uh, situation, and some receipts and things like that. Um, we take care, so the first part we do the feasibility analysis and we look at what abatements are potential, uh, what, a, what abatements you will get, so that means how much carbon credits you're going to get from your project. We help choose a standard, like I mentioned there's a few standards out there, the main two being Gold Standard and Vera, um, and we work with those regulators to set up your project um, with the registration process. Now, these slides will be available, so if you want to have a look in a bit more detail, feel free to have a look once they come through. Next slide, please. Now, I talked a little bit earlier, and Ian mentioned, you know, these, the uh, amount of uh, money that's coming from these is mostly coming from yield. Carbon is a smaller portion of the amount of money you're going to be getting from this, but you also have those other reasons to get started on these projects. That's why we're doing aggregation pro projects, grouped projects. Um, so we're grouping large number of head of cattle together to make viable projects. Um, what I will run through here is just a couple of options. So um, let's start with the one that we have with Feedworks, which is you can join an existing uh, grouped project. Number two is you can start your own grouped project. You can do that with us or Feedworks. Um, and number three is the Bunnings method, which is the DIY. Uh, method you can go and do it yourself uh, but uh, it is challenging and you know we have a lot of expertise that we're working with in Feedworks and within South Pole itself to get these up and running so it, it's not that easy to do. Uh, next slide please. This is a, a very quick look at what the aggregation looks like. I said scale is important. Uh, what I will say about this is it's not like a university project where one person does all of the work. We make sure that uh, we set it up so everybody's taking care of it. That um, you know, we set up the models so that it it's co-created. Uh, it's a deal that supports your business, your goals, and your revenue. Um, so rather than being that kind of university assignment type model where somebody does all of the work and everyone else takes the credit, 
we're looking more at something where we're we've got uh, dogs that are mustering sheep and bringing them into the pen. So we're you know we're not making it hard for you; we're making it easier. Next slide, please. This is just a little bit about the uh, tool that we have for monitoring. Um, I won't go into too much detail here. Basically, we get your data, we upload it, you get your emissions reductions in real time. Um, and this will just make it easier for you to set up the project and you will know what credits are coming your way. Next slide, please. Now I wanna talk about leading the pack and I won't spend too much time on this. Um, there are many other options other than feed additives and you can add all of these together to make a big impact. Um, the, the main ones, and we've just starred the ones which are most suitable for dairy, and soil organic carbon environmental planting for buffers and animal effluent are going to work easiest with or, or you know, work best with um, certain dairies. Not all dairies are the same, uh, so we customise our projects but these are the op the main options that we'd be looking at other than a feed additive project. And you know, these are some of the benefits that we're going to be looking at. You know, soil organic carbon increases, you know that you're growing pasture, so we're going to increase your nutrient availability, water storage, and you get paid for that. Um, for environmental planting, it's mostly going to be designed around um, just putting it on the borders of the paddocks so that we get less wind shear, so that there's less shivering of the animals. So there's um, shelter for livestock um, and animal effluent. This is more suitable for larger dairy operations, so a thousand plus head. Um, and it is a fairly expensive one, but it, it can become viable on certain projects. So we work with the uh, project partners to get these set up. Next slide, please. So this is a, just a quick example of somebody that has got a head of the, the curve. This is a partner that we're currently working with. Um, actually the environmental planting pilot is larger, I think it's around 150 hectares, so it'll be much more credits than that at the moment. But those are the emissions reductions they're looking at and the credits they're looking at for each of the activities that they're undertaking on their farm. This is a real case, this is actually somebody doing and taking the action and getting those credits and getting those emission reductions. Next slide, please. I talked about all of those methods before, um, but what I'm going to talk about here is they're going to be able to be stacked on top of each other. Um, not the feed additives one yet, because that's an international method, but all of the Australian ones uh, that I showed on the previous slides will be able to be stacked on top of each other. So you will get the most bang for buck on these types of projects. Um, this IFLM or Integrated Farm Land Management method is going to be a game changer. We're going to get the most emission, uh, most carbon credits, the most emission reductions by putting as many projects on top of each other as we can. Next slide, please. This is just a quick look at some of the work that we've done here in Australia. We've got over a million hectares um, pro uh, of projects that we're looking after. Now these include soil carbon, buffer planting, like I mentioned, feed additives, as they've gone through animal effluent and beef herd efficiency. And we've successfully delivered millions of credits to farmers. We're looking at around, you know, an average of 200 to 600,000 credits per project on, on some of our projects, which equates to around 7 million to $21 million AUD. But it's not all about money. It's about pasture improvement, it's about future generations, it's about telling your story, it's about shelter for livestock and taking care of your, your farm. Um, at South Pole, what we do is we take care of the, the challenging things, we take care of the regulations, the measurement, verification, all of the hard stuff. We're great at carbon and you're great at farming. We meet in the middle and we create a project together. Next slide, please. This is a quick snapshot of some of the projects that we have in Australia. I don't have the global one here, but this is just a snapshot of some of the ones we've got in Australia that I was mentioning. Next slide. Um, this is just a, a quick call to action because this is these are stats of what consumers are, are wanting. You've likely heard it for years that um, the time for action is now, but now the commercials make sense. 
Um, and as Ian and I mentioned earlier, it's not going to be just government regulations that are pushing you in this direction. It's going to be people, your customers, who then you know, the banks listen to, who the insurers are listening to, who shareholder advocacy groups are listening to. So it's time to take action. Next slide, please. So if you want to be a climate leader, your actions need to match your intentions. Next slide. South Pole, other than just setting up, uh, well, I won't say just, other than setting up climate projects also helps you on your climate leadership journey. Uh, and it goes a little something like this. Next slide, please. This is our global representation. So uh, you can see we're not just a bunch of hippies. There's 1,300 of us. We're across 13, 30 countries. And South Pole is the largest climate consultancy on the planet. So uh, we're, we're doing decently well. All right, I'll pass back to Santos. Thank you very much, Shanti. Um, and thank you, Ian, as well. I'll invite you both back. There you are. Um, I hope attendees found this uh, webinar interesting. I'm going to switch now and look into some question time. So um, let's start for one with one for Ian. Is there an underlying willingness from the ruminant sector in cattle and sheep to act on methane? Do they expect it to be profitable? Ian, can you shine a light? Right, that cuts to the, the, the guts of it, doesn't it, Santos? Um, yeah, I, look, I think that there is an absolute understanding and, and degree and acceptance from our, our sectors, whether it's dairy, beef, sheep, whatever, that people are going to be taking steps forward. I think what's stopped a lot of people has been that they don't necessarily understand the pathway that you have to get into to do it. Um, and yeah, they've sort of got to move past that scenario where some people are telling them they're going to make billions of dollars out of it and it's all going to be, you know, awesome and you're off to Switzerland every every year but that's not going to be the case um, and at the other end there's that thing that says people go oh this is all too hard and it'll never happen I think it is going to happen so I think people are accepting it's going to happen and getting that understanding of how you put together a project is kind of almost central to getting people to move because if they, they, they don't know they'll never move the second bit was do they think it's going to be profitable I reckon most Farmers, like since 87 that I've worked with, farmers make business-based decisions. The producers make business-based decisions and I think their attitude to methane will be just the same. They will take a decision that they, they won't take a decision if it's clearly not going to be profitable. It's going to lose them money. I don't expect people to do it. It's not for them to shoulder the, the weight of the environmental risk, you know, challenge themselves. Um, so I think it's reasonable they will want to take steps that give them a modest return, um, a modest ROI. But I think the ROI can be can be pretty um, modest and it doesn't have to be, you know, turning everybody into a, a squid billionaire, but nor can we expect people to do it unless there is an ROI. So first part is, yeah, I think they are willing. And the second part is, do they expect it to be profitable? Yeah, but I think they're increasingly realistic about what profitable looks like. Thank you, Ian. Great answer there. Um, we'll move to the next one. This one's for Shanti. What methane carbon credit market is available where you can sell your generated credits? Good question. So the credits that we were talking about for feed additives is the voluntary carbon market. So Vera is an international standard and you would sell your credits on the voluntary carbon market. Uh, one of the things that we've, we're sort of being, I guess, if, if I'm going to say match fit, because I quite like that word from Ian, um, we, we got ahead of ourselves and we've been working with people to sort of set up forward purchases. So the prices that I quoted during our presentation are, are the contracts that we're looking at. People are looking to pay that kind of value for those credits. If you go onto the voluntary market, in general, if you go look at the Reputex or any of the sort of carbon trading platforms and you look at the current price, you're probably looking at a lower value. But because we have relationships with consumer product groups, because we have relationships with people who want to purchase these credits and we're setting up these contracts, we're getting around that sort of $30 to $33 US per credit on these ones. 
but they are going to be sold on the voluntary carbon market, direct to consumers. Thanks, Shanti. We got another one, I would say this one's for you too. Um, how do you measure the abatement in a commercial farm? It's a good question. So obviously you need to look at all of the greenhouse gas inputs on that farm. So you need to look at the electricity, you need to look at the machinery, the cattle, you need to look at the vehicles, those types of things. So you do a, a carbon assessment baseline. It's not a, a detailed, when we're, when we're doing these projects, um, I would just say for feed additives, we're, we're looking at um, the cattle in particular, we're looking at the methane emissions from those cattle, um, because you're looking at avoiding emissions. But for the other carbon projects, so um, so I'll just put an underline for the, the feed additives ones, for the nature-based solutions or the uh, Australian-based projects, we do that baseline based on the whole of farm. So, you know, it's not the most comprehensive greenhouse gas accounting, but we, you know, we do a general overview of that farm. We look at how much greenhouse gases are being sort of consumed on, or get created by that farm. And then it gets measured. So that gets baselined and then your credits only come above uh, what your greenhouse gas baseline is. Very well. So, Foss, could, I, could I make a yep. comment around that too? In terms sure. of the feed additives, it's, there's a certified position for a given feed additive, say for, you know, for aggling, there is a certified amount that based on the, the published data that, that that compound is accepted to reduce methane. So that's a prior certification status that, a, that a, a, a compound would have. You're not actually going out and measuring the methane abatement from a group of dairy cows or a feed yard before and after Agilent, that's been done in universities and it's been it's being done through Merrill grants through the federal government. Apparently all that stuff's kind of sitting in the background that gets you your certified um, reduction position. Perfect. All right. We'll see if we sneak one last one in. Um, what credits are you, Shanti, talking about? Um, I think I know the slide they mean. I might go back to that one. Go back to the slide. I think they're probably talking about the projects so if it's a feed additive project, all of the all of the credits are voluntary carbon units. They're all with Vera, they're all with the VN41 method. So I think it says it on, oh, it says it on Moo, it doesn't say it on the other ones, but all of those yeah. emissions reductions, all of those credits are via Vera. Um, and they're, they become voluntary carbon units, which is traded on the voluntary market. Uh, for the other projects that I talked about stacking, those are, ACUs, so those are Australian carbon credit units. Very well. All righty. Four o'clock on the dot. Um, if we have any other questions, we'll make sure to follow up offline. Um, but thank you all for attending. Thank you, Ian and Shanti, for a super entertaining and informative session. Um, yeah, I left it over there. There are details, so make sure to follow up if you have any other pressing questions. and. Yeah, thank you very much for joining everyone. Thanks everyone. Thank you.